MCDB 1161. Our speakers are Adriana Espinoza and Kiela Gaffin, and they will be talking about characterizing novel bacteriophages. Hello, my name is Adriana Espinoza. And I'm Kiala Gappin. And today we'll be discussing the characterization of novel mycobacteriophages in MCDB 1161. To begin, bacteriophages are viruses that can infect bacteria. Their structure consists of a capsid, tail neck, tail, base plate, and tail fibers. And their viral DNA is stored in the capsid, which is kind of the protein coated head of the bacteriophage. The viral genome is inserted into a complementary bacteria via its base plate and tail fibers, which bind specifically to proteins on the surface of that bacteria. The phage DNA then circularizes and the phage can participate in two different life cycles. These two life cycles are the lytic life cycle and the lysogenic life cycle. There are also two types of phages, those that can participate in the, uh, solely the lytic cycle. No, but this was the and uh, those that can participate in both. And these are referred to as temperate phages. Um, as you can see here in both of these life cycles, the phage attaches to the host bacterial cell and in its, it inserts its viral DNA. Uh, we split off here into the lytic life cycle where transcription and replication of lytic genes occurs. Um, from there, we can have protein synthesis. Phage particles are then assembled and um, these lysins and holins are able to degrade the bacterial cell wall. And this allows assembled phages to escape. Um, this successfully lyses the bacterial cell. Uh, here in the lysogenic life cycle, a prophage is formed due to the combination of viral DNA and the DNA of the host cell. Uh, the bacterial cell is then able to replicate normally and no lysis of the cell occurs. And in a temperate phage, a lysogenic cycle is thrust into a lytic one due to the deactivation of its repressor protein. Um, and this can be due to an environmental stressor um, and thus lytic genes can then be expressed. Phages are also grouped into clusters based off of their genome similarity. So in order to be grouped into a cluster, phages must have at least 50% similarity between genomes. Phages that are also in the same cluster can have very similar characteristics, um, and thus they can produce similar proteins. And in order to determine if, if a phage is in a specific cluster, we must sequence the genome. Uh, we can see here in this figure that a bioinformatic tool called Famorator was able to directly compare the genomes of two different phages. From there, we can analyze for that 50% similarity. And clustering is super important because it allows us to establish evolutionary relationships between bacterial strains, as well as the host range of a specific phage. There's also been a continual rise in the abundance of antibiotic resistant bacteria. In certain bacterial populations, there existed variation before the use of the antibiotic. Uh, this variation consisted of resistant strains of bacteria. Uh, so when the antibiotic went in, it was able to kill the non-resistant strains, leaving the resistant strains to have a reproductive advantage. Uh, this changed the allele, sequen uh, the allele frequency in their favor, and thus the antibiotic was no longer useful. Here in this figure, um, it compares penicillin-resistant uh, S. pneumoniae with the total antibiotic use. And you can see here that with the rise of total antibiotic use, the amount of resistant bacterial strains also rises. Um, this can be detrimental to the health of humans because if there is no antibiotic used to combat their pathogenic bacterial infection, uh, this can often lead to fatalities. Mycobacteriophages may also be used in phage cocktails for pathogenic bacterial infections. Um, there has been a rise in antibiotic resistance, which can be fixed with a rise in phage therapy. A phage therapy has been used to combat pathogenic bacterial infections that involve bacteria such as M. abscessus and M. tuberculosis. In this figure, a phage cocktail is delivered to the lungs via a nebulizer or an inhaler. The phage is then able to uh, insert its viral genome into the target bacterial cell. Replication and assembly of phage particles ensues, and lysins and holins allow the phage to be released from the bacterial cell, effectively lysing it. You can see up there that we had uh, different types of phages that were used in this phage cocktail, and this is because the immune system can recognize a phage as foreign. Um, and if it recognizes that, uh, it as foreign, it can destroy it, and so we need backups in order to ensure that this treatment is still effective. Plaque morphology can also be an indicator of phage life cycle. We can see on my plaque, we had um, 
we had plaques that produced uh, a cloudy outer ring and a clear inner ring. Um, this cloudy outer ring showed that the phage was not able to thoroughly lyse the bacteria, but the clear inner ring showed that it was able to do so. So since it had both of these characteristics, we were able to hypothesize that my phage was temperate. In contrast, looking at my plate here on the left, the phage are all producing clear edge plaques, which to us is an indication that these are likely lytic phages, since all of the bacteria in a region where phage are present are being killed off and none of these phages are entering the lysogenic life cycle, which would allow bacteria in that region to remain alive despite being infected. Next, we would do an electron microscopy to figure out the morphotype of the phage that we were able to isolate. Uh, my phage was called M. Lee, and through electron microscopy, we were able to see that my phage had an icosahedral head and a long non-contractile tail. Um, this is very consistent with the Cifo Verde category of phages. Similarly, the phage that my group isolated called wormals also has an icosahedral head with a long tail that is characteristic of Cifoviridae. For the most part, Cifoviridae have extremely high tail length to head diameter ratios, namely their tails are longer than their heads are wide. And so while not all of the phages in the Cifoviridae family have icosahedral heads, as we see here in Kayan, a phage isolated by Adrian and Amber in this semester's um, section of MCDB 1161. KN has a prolate head, which is kind of this extended oblong form, but as we can see, the tail length of KN is still significantly longer than its head diameter, and so it's still characterized as a Sipovirde phage. While there are multiple different families of phages, the other major type of phage isolated in this course is the myoviridae phage, as seen here in iota. Myoviridae phages have um, a tail length that is approximately equal to its head diameter, and they also tend to have contractile machinery near the base of the head on the tail, while it's not very obvious in this particular picture. And so once we've determined the morph morphotype of our phage by electron microscopy and have determined whether it's a lytic or temperate phage, we then tend to isolate DNA from our phages for further analysis to help us cluster them, which as Adriana mentioned, is important for determining things like host range and what kind of other bacteria our phage might be able to infect. And so in order to narrow down which cluster our phage might belong to, we first digest it with a number of different restriction enzymes seen here at the top of the gel. And because phages in the same cluster, as she mentioned, have over 50% genome similarity, they also tend to have restriction enzymes bind and cut at similar or the same locations. And so they end up having similar numbers of fragments when run out on a gel. And so when we perform this type of analysis, we can then compare the patterning on a gel such as this to other previously archived and clustered phages. We use a bioinformatics tool called Phage Enzyme Tools to do this. And so looking, for example, at BioMH1, this was a gel run of the restriction digest I did of our phage wormals. We can see that it was cut probably six or more times by BioMH1. And so we perform, we put this setting here where we look at cut um, phages that were cut between five and 16 times by BAMH1, and we get an output of phages that have already been archived and clusters, clustered with a similar number of cuts. And so from this, we started to determine that wormholes might belong to a K or N cluster. Now, this is a gel run, not of wormals, but of another phage called zucchini bread, isolated by Malia and Sophie this semester. And they predicted that it might belong to the B1 cluster. And so they PCR amplified their phage's genome with B1 cluster specific primers seen here in the far right lane. And clearly there is a band um, representing that amplification product from the binding of these B1 cluster specific primers to zucchini bread's genome. And to us, this suggests that this is pretty good evidence that zucchini bread is probably a B cluster, B1 cluster phage, as especially um, emphasized by the success of both of the controls. In the positive control, we PCR amplify a known A3 cluster phage with A3 cluster specific primers. And so clearly there's this very obvious band from where that PCR um, amplification product has been run on the gel. In the negative control, we don't add any phage DNA to our reaction, and so as expected, there's no prominent band. All of these ones at the bottom are representative, representative of primer dimerization events, where the primers anneal to one another and then are visible at the bottom of the gel here at a very low um, length. <laughs> 
And so overall kind of reviewing what we do in MCDB 1161 to characterize these novel mycobacteriophages, we begin by looking at the plaque morphology that our phage produces in order to determine whether it's probably lytic or temperate in nature or lysogen, uh, temperate in nature, apologies. We then submit it to imaging by electron microscopy and use those images to determine whether a phage is likely civilverde or myoverde, which are the two most common families of phages that we find in this particular course. We then isolate the phage's DNA and submit it to restriction digest by a number of different restriction enzymes to start to narrow down which cluster our phage might belong to based on the patterning of fragments run out on a gel compared to previously clustered phages. Based on this narrowing, we then perform PCR amplification with cluster-specific primers to help us determine whether we have good evidence for our phage belonging to a given cluster. Regardless of whether PCR amplification is successful, though, we can then decide to send our phage off for sequencing, which, as Adriana mentioned, is the only actual way we have of determining whether a phage belongs to a particular, cl particular cluster or subcluster, given that with those sequencing results, we can then determine whether it meets that 50% genome similarity cutoff to other phages in a given cluster. So to kind of zoom out and look at why we study phages in the host we do, which is Mycobacterium schmigmatis. This is because M. schmigmatis is non-pathogenic in humans, but it is a close evolutionary co cousin to a number of pathogenic um, bacteria, including Mycobacterium leprae, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and M. abscessus. And so already we've seen phages isolated by students just like us being used successfully in therapy of patients. And so in this particular case study, um, a patient with cystic fibrosis had an antibiotically resistant uh, strain of M. abscessus. And um, treatment was not working, obviously, because it was antibiotically resistant. But when they were treated with a cocktail of a number of different phages, you can see here over time, at the amount of phage in their system increases. And this correlates very closely with the predicted lung capacity shown here on the left. And so visually on the right, we see that as time progresses, as this phage therapy has the chance to take effect, the, the infection in the patient begins to dissipate and the phages are capable and able to get rid of that infection. And so generally speaking, we're interested in studying phages in MCDB 1161, not only because they're incredibly interesting and they're the most abundant entities by a wide margin here on earth, but also because of things like this, because there's a great potential for their use in medical treatment. They've already started changing the way that we think about medicine and how we can use medicine to treat things that are beginning to develop be beyond our current modern medical means of treating them. And so we'd like to thank you for being here this evening and listening to our talk, and we'd be happy to take any questions you may have at this time. If you have any speak questions for our speakers, you can ask in the chat or uh, go ahead and raise your hand. What do um, the points one, two, and three mean here in this figure? Points one. Oh, these are just arrows pointing out the different localizations of the um, the infection. You had a question in the chat asking you where you got your phage names. Um, so students get to pick the name of their phage um, once they've isolated enough of that phage, and um, yes, isolated isolated it from other phages in um, the soil sample they collect. So for instance, my um, group named our phage wormles because a worm was found in the soil sample we um, got our phage from. And it's also based off um, the there, this toy called um, squirmels, which obviously you can't name your phage after something that um, is copyrighted and already exists. But if you look it up, I'm sure most of you know what squirmels is, are. Uh, and um, and oh, good. <laughs> Uh, we I chose the name of our phage. It was called Emily. Uh, my lab partner, her name is Emily Franks, um, and the host bacteria that we used in this lab was called M. smegmatis. So it was kind of a play on both of those names. Great. And then Mason has a question. Yes. Yeah, so for the phage therapy, 
Um, do you guys edit the bacterial phages to work in terms of like injecting a specific genome that you want to be produced or is it just to lyse the, the bacteria itself? In general, our main goal is to lyse the bacteria since they, they're resistant to antibiotics. Um, sometimes we do choose to genetically engineer the phage though. Um, if they're temperate phages, it's pretty detrimental to use them in phage therapy since they're not actually going to achieve that. They're not going to kill all of the bacteria they infect. And because they're reintegrating with the, the host's genome, there's a potential for genetic crossover events um, that might make them resistant to other phage infection. Um, so sometimes we genetically engineer those phages if they're capable of infecting the host, but they are temperate to only be able to undergo the lytic life cycle. Uh, and as we stated previously, there's a repressor protein um, that kind of stops lytic genes from being expressed. So once we deactivate that, um, we'll be able to switch a lysogenic life cycle into a lytic one. All right, thank you very much. I think there's one last question in the chat if, it, oh. if the speakers are willing to answer one more. Can you read it? Yep. Um, do you know how the phage was delivered in these patients' cases? I don't remember exactly in the case study that we looked at in these slides. Um, if you're interested, I believe the patient's name was Isabella. Um, the paper that these figures were taken from was published in Nature a few years ago. Okay, thank you so much. Such a good job.